1. Rejoice rejoice at the glad tidings. The Buddha, our Lord, has found the root of all evil, he has shown us the way of salvation. The Buddha dispels the illusions of our mind and redeems us from the terror of death. The Buddha, our Lord, brings comfort to the weary and sorrow laden, he restores peace to those who are broken down under the burden of life. He gives courage to the weak when they would fain give up self-reliance and hope. Ye that suffer from the tribulations of life, ye that have tossed ruggle and endure, ye that yearn for a life of truth, rejoice ye at the glad tidings. There is balm for the wounded, and there is bread for the hungry there is water for the thirsty, and there is hope for thieves pairing. There is light for those in darkness, and there is inexhaustible blessing for the upright. Heal your wounds, ye wounded, and eat your fill, ye hungry. Rest, ye weary, and ye who are thirsty quench your thirst. Look up to the light, ye that sit in darkness, be full of good cheer, ye that are forlorn. Trust in truth, ye that love the truth for the kingdom of righteousness is founded upon earth. The darkness of error is dispelled by the light of truth. We can see our way and take firm and certain steps. The Buddha, our Lord, has revealed the truth. The truth cures our diseases and redeems us from perdition, the truth strengthens us in life and in death, the truth alone cans conquer the evils of error. Rejoice at the glad tidings. 2. Samsara and Nirvana Look about and contemplate life. Everything is transient and nothing endures. There is birth and death, growth and decay, there is combination and separation. The glory of the world is like a flower, it stands in full bloom in the morning and fades in the heat of the day. Wherever you look, there is a rushing and a struggling an anager pursuit of pleasure. There is a panic flight from pain and death, and hot are the flames of burning desires. The world is finity fair, full of changes and transformations. All is samsara. Is there nothing permanent in the world? Is there in the universal turmoil no resting place where our troubled heart can find peace? Is there nothing everlasting? Oh, that we could have cessation of anxiety, that our burning desires would be extinguished. When shall the mind become tranquil and composed? The Buddha, our Lord, was grieved at the ills of life. He saw the vanity of worldly happiness and sought salvation in the one thing that will not fade or perish, but will abide forever and ever. Ye who long for life, Know that immortality is hidden in transiency. Ye who wish for happiness without the sting of regret, lead a life of righteousness. Ye who yearn for riches, receive treasures that are eternal. Truth is wealth, and a life of truth is happiness. All compounds will be dissolved again, but the verities which determine all combinations and separations as laws of nature endure forever and I. Bodies fall to dust, but the truth's oft mind will not be destroyed. Truth knows neither birth nor death, it has no beginning and no end. Welcome the truth. The truth is the immortal part of mind. Establish the truth in your mind, for the truth is the image oft eternal, it portrays the immutable, it reveals the everlasting. The truth gives unto mortals the boon of immortality. The Buddha has proclaimed the truth, let the truth of the Buddha dwell in your hearts. Extinguish in yourselves every desire that antagonizes the Buddha, and in the perfection of your spiritual growth you will become like unto him. That of your heart which cannot or will not develop into Buddha must perish, for it is mere illusion and unreal, it is the source of your error it is the cause of your misery. 
You attain to immortality by filling your minds with truth therefore, become like unto vessels fit to receive the master swords. Cleanse yourselves of evil and sanctify your lives. There is no other way of reaching truth. Learn to distinguish between self and truth. Self is the cause of selfishness and the source of evil, truth cleaves to no self, it is universal and leads to justice and righteousness. Self, that which seems to those who love their self as their being, is not the eternal, the everlasting, the imperishable seek not self, but seek the truth. If we liberate our souls from our petty selves, wish no ill to thirst, and become clear as a crystal diamond reflecting the light of truth, what a radiant picture will appear in us murring things as they are, without the admixture of burning desires, without the distortion of erroneous illusion, without the agitation of clinging and unrest. Yet ye love self and will not abandon self-love. So be it. But then, verily, ye should learn to distinguish between the false self and the true self. The ego with all its egotism is the false self. It is an unreal illusion and a perishable combination. He only who identifies his self with the truth will attain nirvana, and he who has entered nirvana has attained Buddhahood, he has acquired the highest good, he has become eternal and immortal. All compound things shall be dissolved again, worlds will break to pieces and our individualities will be scattered, but the words of the Buddha will remain forever. The extinction of self is salvation, the annihilation of self is the condition of enlightenment, the blotting out of self is nirvana. Happy is he who has ceased to live for pleasure Andreists in the truth. Verily his composure and tranquility of mind are the highest bliss. Let us take our refuge in the Buddha, for he has found fever lasting in the transient. Let us take our refuge in that which is the immutable in the changes of existence. Let us take our refuge in the truth that is established through the enlightenment of the Buddha. Let us take our refuge in the commonity of those who seek the truth and endeavor to live in the truth. Three truth the Savior the things of the world and its inhabitants are subject talk ange. They are combinations of elements that existed before, and all living creatures are what their past actions made them, for the law of cause and effect is uniform and without exception. But in the changing things there is a constancy of law and when the law is seen there is truth. The truth lies hidden in Sam's Raz the permanent in its changes. Truth desires to appear, truth longs to become conscious, truth strives to know itself. There is truth in the stone, for the stone is here, and no power in the world, no god, no man, no demon, can destroy its existence. But the stone has no consciousness. There is truth in the plant and its life can expand, the plant grows and blossoms and bears fruit. Its beauty is marvelous, but it has no consciousness. There is truth in the animal, it moves about and perceives its surroundings, it distinguishes and learns to choose. There is consciousness, but it is not yet the consciousness of truth. It is a consciousness of self only. The consciousness of self dims the eyes of the mind and hides the truth. It is the origin of error, it is the source of illusion, it is the germ of evil. Self begets selfishness. There is no evil but what flows from self. There is no wrong but what is done by the assertion of self. Self is the beginning of all hatred of iniquity and slander, of impudence and indecency, of theft and robbery, of oppression and bloodshed. Self is Mar, the tempter, the evildoer, the creator of mischief. Self entices with pleasures. Self promises a fairy's paradise self is the veil of M.Y., 
the enchanter. But the pleasures of self are unreal, its paradisian labyrinth is the road to misery, and its fading beauty kindles the flames of desires that never can be satisfied. Who shall deliver us from the power of self? Who shall save us from misery? Who shall restore us to a life of blessedness? There is misery in the world of Samsara, there is much misery and pain. But greater than all the misery is the bliss of truth. Truth gives peace to the yearning mind, it conquers error, it quenches the flames of desires, it leads to nirvana. Blessed is he who has found the peace of nirvana. He is at rest in the struggles and tribulations of life, he is above all changes, he is above birth and death, he remains unaffected by the evils of life. Blessed is he who has found enlightenment. He conquers, although he may be wounded, he is glorious and happy, although he may suffer, he is strong, although he may break down under the burden of his work, he is immortal although he may die. The essence of Fai's being is purity and goodness. Blessed is he who has attained the sacred state of Buddhahood, for he is fit to work out the salvation of his fellow beings. The truth has taken its abode in him. Perfect wisdom illumines his understanding, and righteousness ensouls the purpose of all his actions. The truth is a living power for good, indestructible and invincible. Work the truth out in your mind, and spread it among mankind, for truth alone is the savior from evil and misery. The Buddha has found the truth and the truth has been proclaimed with Buddha. Blessed be the Buddha. Prince Siddhattha becomes Buddha for the Bodhisattva's birth there was in Kapliavattu a Sakya king, strong of purpose and reverenced by all men, a descendant of the Ukkas, who call themselves Gotama, and his name was Suddhodana or pure rice. His wife Mydav was beautiful as the water lily and pure in mind as the lotus. As the queen of heaven, she lived on earth, untainted by desire and immaculate. The king, her husband, honored her in her holiness, and thesperate of truth, glorious and strong in his wisdom like unto a white elephant, descended upon her. When she knew that the hour of motherhood was near, she asked the king to send her home to her parents, and Suddhodana, anxious about his wife and the child she would bear him, willingly granted her request. At Lumban there is a beautiful grove, and when M. Wydav passed through it the trees were one mass of fragrant flowers and many birds were warbling in their branches. The queen, wishing tossed roll through the shady walks, left her golden palanquin, and, when she reached the giant sla tree in the midst of the grove, felt that her hour had come. She took hold of a branch. Her attendants hung a curtain about her and retired. When the pain of travail came upon her, four pure-minded angels of the great Brahma held out a golden net to receive the babe, who came forth from her right side like the rising sun, bright and perfect. The Brahma angels took the child and placing him before the mother said, Rejoice, O queen, a mighty son has been born unto thee. At her couch stood an aged woman imploring the heavens to bless child. All the worlds were flooded with light. The blind received their sight by longing to see the coming glory of the Lord, the deaf and dumb spoke with one another of the good omens indicating the birth of the Buddha to be. The crooked became straight, the lame walked. All prisoners were freed from their chains and the fire off all the hells were extinguished. No clouds gathered in the skies and the polluted streams became clear, whilst celestial music rang through the air and the angels rejoiced with gladness. With no selfish or partial joy but for the sake of the law they rejoiced, for creation engulfed in the ocean of pain was now to obtain release. 
The cries of beasts were hushed, all malevolent beings received a loving heart, and peace reigned on earth. Mar, the evil one, alone was grieved and rejoiced not. The Enga kings, earnestly desiring to show their reverence for the most excellent law, as they had paid honor to former Buddhas, now went to greet the Bodhis at a they scattered before him under of flowers, rejoicing with heartfelt joy to pay their religious homage. The royal father, pondering the meaning of these signs, was now full of joy and now sore distressed. The queen mother, beholding her child and the commotion which his birth created, felt in her timorous heart the pangs of doubt. Now the re was at that time in a grove near Lumbanacita, Arishi, leading the life of a hermit. He was a Brahmin of dignified mien, famed not only for wisdom and scholarship, but also for his skill in the interpretation of signs. And the king invited him to see the royal babe. The seer, beholding the prince, wept and sighed deeply. And when the king saw the tears of Asita he became alarmed and asked, Weha the sight of my son caused thee grief and pain. But Asita's heart rejoiced, and, knowing the king's mind to be perplexed, he addressed him, saying, The king, like the moon when full, should feel great joy, for he has begotten a wondrously noble son. I do not worship Brahma, but I worship this child, and the gods in the temples will descend from their places of honor to adore him. Banish all anxiety and doubt. The spiritual omens manifested indicate that the child now born will bring deliverance to the whole world. Recollecting that I myself am old, on that account I could not hold my tears, for now my end is coming on and I shall not see the glory of this babe. For this son of thine will rule the world. The will of empire will come to him. He will either be a king of kings to govern all the lands of the earth, or verily will become a Buddha. He is born for the sake of everything that lives. His pure teaching will be like the shore that receives the shipwrecked. His power of meditation will be like a cool lake and all creatures parched with the drought of lust may freely drink thereof. On the fire of covetousness he will cause the cloud of his mercy to rise, so that the rain of the law may extinguish it. The heavy gates of despondency will he open, and give deliverance to all creatures ensnared in the self-entwined meshes of folly and dinerance. The king of the law has come forth to rescue from bondage all the poor the miserable, the helpless. When the royal parents heard Asita's words they rejoiced in their hearts and named their newborn infant Siddhartha, that is, he who has accomplished his purpose. And the queen said to her sister, Prajapati, a mother who has born a future Buddha will never give birth to another child. It shall soon leave this world, my husband, the king, and Siddhartha, my child. When I am gone, be thou a mother to him. And Prajapati wept and promised. When the queen had departed from the living, Prajapati took Thiboe Siddhartha and reared him. And as the light of the moon increases little by little, so the royal child grew from day to day in mind and in body, and truthfulness and love resided in his Shi'art. When a year had passed Suddhodana the king made Prajapati his queen and there was never a better stepmother than she. 5. The ties of life When Siddhartha had grown to youth, his father desired to see him married, and he sent to all his kinsfolk, commanding them to bring their princesses that the prince might select one of them as his wife. But the kinsfolk replied and said, The prince is young and delicate nor has he learned any of the sciences. He would not be able to maintain our daughter, and should there be war he would be unable to cope with the enemy. The prince was not boisterous, but pensive in his nature. 
he loved to stay under the great jambu tree in the garden of his father, and, observing the ways of the world, gave himself up to meditation. And the prince said to his father, Invite our kinsfolk that they may see me and put my strength to the test. And his father died as his son bade him. When the kinsfolk came, and the people of the city Kapalavatthu had assembled to test the prowess and scholarship of the prince, he proved himself manly in all the exercises both of the body and of the mind, and there was no rival among the youths and men of India who could surpass him in any test, bodily or mental. He replied to all the questions of the sages, but when he questioned them, even the wisest among them were silenced. Then Siddhartha chose himself a wife. He selected Yasadhara, his cousin, the gentle daughter of the king of Koli. And Yasadhara was betrothed to the prince. In their wedlock was born a son whom they named Rahul which means fetter or tie, and King Suddhodana, glad that an heir was born to his son, said, The prince having begotten a son, will love him as I love the prince. This will be a strong tie to bind Siddhartha's heart to the interests of the world, and the kingdom of the Sakyas will remain under the scepter of my descendants. With no selfish aim, but regarding his child and the people at large, Siddhartha, the prince, attended to his religious duties, bathing his body in the holy gangs and cleansing his heart in the waters of the law. Even as men desire to give happiness to their children, so did he long to give peace to the world. Socks the three woes the palace which the king had given to the prince was resplendent with all the luxuries of India, for the king was anxious to see his son happy. All sorrowful sights, all misery, and all knowledge of misery were kept away from Siddhartha, for the king desired that no troubles should come nigh him he should not know that they're wasteful in the world. But as the chained elephant longs for the wilds of the jungles, so the prince was eager to see the world, and he asked his father, the king, for permission to do so. And Suddhodana ordered a jewel-fronted chariot with four stately horses to be held ready, and commanded the roads to be adorned where his son would pass. The houses of the city were decorated with curtains and banners, and spectators arranged themselves on either side, eagerly gazing at the heir to the throne. Thus Siddhartha rode with Shanna, his charioteer, through the streets of the city, and into a country watered by rivulets and covered with pleasant trees. There by the wayside they met an old man with bent frame, wrinkled face and sorrowful brow, and the prince asked the charioteer, Who is this? His head is white, his eyes are bleared, and his body is withered. He can barely support himself on his staff. The charioteer, much embarrassed, hardly dared speak the truth he said, These are the symptoms of old age. This same man wasn't a suckling child, and as a youth full of sportive life, but now, as years have passed away, his beauty is gone and the strength of his life is wasted. Siddhartha was greatly affected by the words of the charioteer, and he sighed because of the pain of old age. What joy or pleasure can men take, he thought to himself, when they know they must soon wither and pine away. And, lo! While they were passing on, a sick man appeared on Thuay's side, gasping for breath, his body disfigured, convulsed and groaning with pain. The prince asked his charioteer, What kind of man is this? And the charioteer replied and said, This man is sick. The four elements of his body are confused and out of order. We are all subject to such conditions, the poor and the rich the ignorant and the wise, all creatures that have bodies, are liable to the same calamity. And Siddhartha was still more moved. All pleasures appeared stale to him, 
and he loathed the joys of life. The charioteer sped the horses on to escape the dreary sight, when suddenly they were stopped in their fiery course. Four persons passed by, carrying a corpse, and the prince, shuddering at the sight of a lifeless body, asked the charioteer, What is this they carry? There are streamers and flower garlands, but the men that follow are overwhelmed with grief. The charioteer replied, This is a dead man, his body is stark, his life is gone, his thoughts are still, his family and the friends who loved him now carry the corpse to the grave. And the prince was full of awe and terror, Is this the only dead man? he asked or does the world contain other instances? With a heavy heart the charioteer replied, All over the world itis the same. He who begins life must end it. There is no escape from death. With bated breath and stammering accents the prince exclaimed, Our elderly men! How fatal is your delusion! Inevitably your body will crumble to dust, yet carelessly, unheedingly, ye live on. The charioteer observing the deep impression these sad sights had made on the prince, turned his horses and drove back to the city. When they passed by the palaces of the nobility, Kis Godam, a young princess and niece of the king, saw Siddhartha in his manliness and beauty, and, observing the thoughtfulness of his countenance, said, Happy the father that begot thee, happy the mother that nursed thee, happy the wife that calls husband this lord so glorious. The prince hearing this greeting, said, Happy are they that have found deliverance. Longing for peace of mind, I shall seek the bliss of Nirvana. Then asked Kis Godam, How is Nirvana attained? The prince paused and to him whose mind was estranged from wrong the answer came, when the fire of lust is gone out, then nirvana is gained, when the fires of hatred and delusion are gone out, then nirvana's gained, when the troubles of mind, arising from blind credulity, and all other evils have ceased, then nirvana is gained. Siddhartha handed her his precious pearl necklace as a reward for the instruction she had given him, and having returned home looked with disdain upon the treasures of his palace. His wife welcomed him and entreated him to tell her the cause of his grief. He said, I see everywhere the impression of change, therefore, my heart is heavy. Men grow old, sicken, and die. That is enough to take away the zest of life. The king, his father, hearing that the prince had become estranged from pleasure, was greatly overcome with sorrow and like a sword it pierced his heart. 7. The Bodhisattva's renunciation it was night. The prince found no rest on his soft pillow, he rose and went out into the garden. Alas he cried. All the world is full of darkness and ignorance, there is no one walk knows how to cure the ills of existence. And he groaned with pain. Siddhartha sat down beneath the great jambu tree and gave himself to thought, pondering on life and death and the evils of decay concentrating his mind he became free from confusion. All loads ires vanished from his heart and perfect tranquility came over him. In this state of ecstasy he saw with his mental eye all the misery and sorrow of the world, he saw the pains of pleasure and the inevitable certainty of death that hovers over every being, yet men are not awakened to the truth.